sure. Okay. Welcome everybody to genotype phenotype findings. Um, gosh, we just finished up another session, kind of advanced genetics. It was a great session. There was a lot of information. Um, so this session will focus more on the genotype phenotype findings, and I know at the end we're going to allow a little bit more time for for questions and answers. So, uh, just a couple of reminders. There are two research projects that might be of interest to you. One is the Family McDermott Syndrome International Patient Registry. If you haven't already stopped by the desk, it's just right outside the door, um, this direction. And you can ask any questions and upload your genetic reports. The other project that's going on is with Dr. Sanchez from Cedars-Sinai. And this is a project in which it takes a picture of your child, 360 degree picture, and the goal is to create a composite image of Phelan McDermott syndrome, and the enrollment has been fabulous. You guys have killed it. We have over 50 participants in that, and now it's possible not just to have sort of a composite image of PMS, which will probably end up looking kind of average, but because we've had so many families participate, we think we might even be able to have like a, com a picture, a composite picture of patients with big deletions, a composite picture of patients with small deletions, a composite picture of patients with mutations. Um, so the more people that participate at this point, if we can maybe get 10 more patients with mutations, a handful more patients with ring deletions, we might be able to have multiple composite pictures. So we really want to encourage everybody to participate in that. Um, okay, so uh, this is Dr. Catalina Betancourt. Um, many of you have met her because you've done the one-to-one -one consultations with her, or you've heard her speaking at um, the other sessions in the past. Um, Dr. Betancourt is a, a, clinic, a clinical geneticist and a researcher. She works at the INSERM in Paris. The INSERM is sort of like the NIH in France. And she has, um, she works, she, she researches all different kinds of genetic disorders associated with neurodevelopmental disabilities, but she's really become an expert specifically in Shank 3. So welcome and thank you. So, so hi everybody. So as Geraldine said today, uh, I will focus on the analysis of the data of the uh, Phelan McDermott Syndrome International Registry. And since we talked already a lot in the previous session about the specific genetic findings, I don't think that I need to go once again through all of that. But if any of you have questions about that subject, you can ask them at the end or uh, when you see me in the corridor, you can catch me and ask. Okay, so as you know, the foundation has made a great effort to create this registry to collect the genetic and clinical data. Are you hearing me okay? I have like a, okay. Uh, to, to collect the genetic and clinical data of the families affected by Phelan McDermott syndrome. It was created in 2012. It's translated into, it's in English, translated into Spanish, French, and Italian. Most of the patients are English uh, speaking. So today we have uh, 1,193 patients registered, but of these only 774 have at least some genetic or clinical data. It doesn't even mean that all have both types of data. And this is very strange to me. I don't understand this very well, but there are 419 families that registered but have not submitted any answer to any questionnaire or no genetic report, okay? And so <laughs> I would really encourage, if you identify into this group, I would really encourage you to participate in the registry, really participate because this, I mean, we c there is nothing to analyze here, okay? So really participate and contribute your genetic data. You can give your genetic reports to the table at the, re at the registry and they will scan it for them. And then you will um, have to answer 
three questionnaires, a clinical questionnaire, a developmental questionnaire, and for those that are adolescent and adults, there is what we call the adult questionnaire, but it's also for uh, adolescents. And you don't, it's a lot of questions. You don't have to do everything at the same time. You can do it slowly. It's very important that you take your time to answer correctly, because what I've noticed analyzing this is that there are many, many, many mistakes, many. So clearly, but if I'm, I know it's difficult, I know it's tiresome, I know all this, but there are some families that maybe could pay more attention to avoid these kind of mistakes. Uh, so we can have the cleanest data possible to make this analysis and remember that all this that we do is not for us, it's for you. We want to analyze the data to give it back to you to be able to answer the questions that you ask us. And for us to answer those questions, we need you to give your, us your data. If, if it's not for the families that give the data to this type of uh, projects, we wouldn't be able to know what's the possibility of my child having this or this feature. What does it mean that he has a deletion of this size rather than a big one or a smaller one? This is the type of questions that we not want to answer and because there are so many different sizes and mutations, different types, ring, translocation, whatever. We need a lot of data from patients. Anyway, so from these patients, there are only 755 that have felon McDermott syndrome. There are 19 that have other genetic abnormalities that do not cause felon McDermott syndrome. So the analysis is being focused on these two. But of these, only 306 have genetic reports with either mut pathogenic mutation or array coordinates. You will see that for the analysis that we do, taking into account the deletion size, I need to know the deletion size. If a patient, for example, was diagnosed with a fish or with a karyotype, we know that this patient has a deletion of 22Q13, but we don't know the size. So, unfortunately, we cannot include this patient in the analysis. So. The only patients that I can use are those that have array coordinates or have pathogenic chunk three mutations, okay? So I'm going to focus all the data that you're going to see on this analysis when I do the genotype-phenotype correlations. But at the beginning, this is like a general description of the data of the registry of the patients that have submitted information. So you see that normally PMS, because it's uh, caused by chunk three, which is in an autosomal chromosome, meaning that it's not related to sex, it should be 50-50 males and females. But every time we analyze the data, we see a little bit more of females than males, okay? We don't, I, really, I don't think that this means something, but we have to see when we have more uh, patients if this is true that there are a little bit more females. Okay, the mean age of the patients in the registry is 13 years, the youngest is less than one year, the oldest is 52 years. These are the countries of origin of the families that have participated. You see that most families come from the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, and then Spain, Canada, France, Italy, Brazil. Um, this is the age of the patients at diagnosis of Felan McDermott. You see there are a few patients that were diagnosed in utero. There is quite a number that were diagnosed in the first year of life, and also these have early diagnosis. But you see others were also diagnosed very late, okay? Of course, the most recent ones are usually, no, I would say diagnosed more early, no, because we're having recent diagnosis of, of uh, patients 30 years old, 40 years old that had never been tested before. Okay, so uh, these, these are not genotype, phenotype correlations in the sense that here I'm just describing, I'm taking a group of patients with PMS. For example, here I took 725 patients, okay, that had answered this question, does the patient have seizures? And then I see how many answered yes, how many answered unsure, no, and there were 30 that didn't answer this question. So this, I take them the out. And there are like a third of patients with felon McDermott that have seizures, okay? So this is just information for you to know the frequency of the disorders in felon McDermott, taking all the patients together and the type of seizures that we can encounter. So this confirms what we know already. There are many different types of seizures. There are febrile seizures associated with fever or seizures not associated with fever and the types are very varied. But the most common one as Dr. Jimmy Holder said in his presentation in the Macposius, are absence seizures. 
Uh, remember that someone said, what's the typical age for adults to develop seizures? There was one question in the McPosium, and the answer with this uh, slide is there is no typical age to develop seizures. So we see here febrile and no febrile seizures. So as expected, younger kids have more frequent febrile seizures because these only happen in young kids. When you grow older, you stop having seizures are related to fever, even if you have a problem. And then there are no febrile seizures, that seizures that occur not in the context of fever. And you can see that there are some that start very early, but you see that at every age, there are some patients that can start having seizures at this point, even very, very late. So when you see this and you say, is there a specific age where I can expect that my child is going to develop seizures? The answer is no, okay? So this question, has the patient ever been diagnosed with any of the following gastrointestinal conditions? And the yes answer is overwhelmingly positive. So 57% say yes. And what were the disorders that people said their children had? Many, many, the most common one, said their child had gastroesophageal reflux. So we knew this already, we confirmed it. It's the most common one. Chronic constipation is also very common. Others complain of chronic diarrhea. A few have constipation alternating with diarrhea. And very few have either irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease. And only two have peptic ulcers, okay? In this, when I see multiple answers possible, this is why I didn't calculate a percentage because a patient could have said yes to this, 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 and this, okay? So age of onset of gastrointestinal disorders. So you see here that the frequency of gastroesophageal reflux, it can start very early in very young babies and it increases over time and it's quite steep. So at the end, not at the end, let's say in adults, Almost everyone has gastroesophageal reflux, you see. Chronic constipation also increases with age, but it's less prevalent, whereas chronic diarrhea and irritable bowel syndrome don't seem to increase with age so much. So what does it tell us in practical terms? Everyone that has a child with PMS needs to be aware of the fact that these children are very likely to develop gastroesophageal reflux, and this can affect them their, their well-being quite a lot, so this needs to be managed, okay? This concerns kidney conditions. So here I included renal malformations, so are things that happen in utero, but there is this question about recurrent urinary tract infections. When you have recurrent urinary tract infections, it means that you have repeated uh, urine inf urinary infections. It usually means that you have a malformation that it's predisposing to these infections, but not necessarily, okay? But uh, so if anyone answered yes to any of these, the answer, it was 27%. So a third of patients say they have these kidney conditions. And you see that many have malformations of the kidney, okay? This can be um, diagnosed with ultrasound. So because it's quite common to have these renal conditions in PMS, uh, they should be uh, screened with ultrasound, okay? These are the patients that had an abnormal brain MRI or CT scan. You see that there are almost 40% that had an abnormality in one of these tests. And as you may know, the most common abnormality is an ar arachnoid cyst, okay? But it's also quite common to find decreased myelination. This, this is the decreased white matter of the brain. Uh, some have irregular ventricles, and there are other things. For example, abnormalities of the corpus callosum seem to be quite prevalent. Some have cerebellum malformations. And uh, um, these uh, malformations are considered non-specific in the sense that there are many other neurogenetic disorders that can have similar uh, things uh, compared to Fallon McDermott syndrome. Okay. Um, has the patient ever had a thyroid gland problem? Only 4% answered yes. It could be hypothyroidism, so these patients need to be treated with thyroid hormone. A few had hyperthyroidism or Hashimoto's disease, which is an inflammation of the thyroid, which is associated with hypothyroidism. It's very rare. But thyroid disorders are quite prevalent in the general population. So I'm not sure that this is a real increase compared to the general population, okay? But 
it's also nice to know that this can happen and be aware because if your child develops, develops a hypothyroidism, it's you better diagnose it because it's something that interferes with the quality of life a lot. Okay, so this is the first time I analyzed this data concerning lymphedema, and there are 6% of patients that answered that had a diagnosis of lymphedema. And you will see later the genotype-phenotype correlation of this parameter, which is quite interesting. Okay, so now we enter into the genotype-phenotype correlation analysis, and as I said, I am going to look the lesion size or implication of chunk three, so I need to know the deletion size. I can only use 306 patients, including all these with deletions, and 13% that have sequence mutations that were analyzed and were considered pathogenic. Remember that not, not all sequence variants in chunk three are pathogenic, so only those that I interpreted using accepted guidelines as being pathogenic, okay? So this include simple terminal deletions in almost all patients, 75%. There are only three patients that have an interstitial deletion. There are 8% that have unbalanced translocation, 8% that have ring chromosome, three that have a deletion duplication. And for those of you that went to the previous talk, remember that I told you that if you see a deletion, this is a terminal deletion, accompanied by an interstitial duplication of chromosome 22, this suggests that this, pa this patient has a chromosomal rearrangement, most likely a ring chromosome or maybe another chromosomal rearrangement. So they are classified like this, but it's because these nine patients have not had a karyotype. If, we, if they had had a karyotype, maybe we would know that they are in this category, ring, or maybe they are in the category other rearrangements. So maybe they are only have that as a coincidence, but it's quite strange that they would have this isolated, okay? So if your child is in this category and he or she has never had a karyotype, you need to test him anyway. So of these patients, of these abnormalities, there are 10 that are mosaic, okay? Meaning the abnormality appear later in the, very early, but later in development, so not, not all the cells in the body are affected. Okay, the sizes, as we said, are very variable. Here, the, the, the smallest is 10, the largest is 9.1 megabases. Okay, so what do we do when, when we perform genotype-phenotype correlations? This is a slide to show you what the principle of how it works. This is not real data. So we have here deletions. Every horizontal line is a deletion of different sizes. Here is the largest one. Here is the smallest. And here at the end, I include patients with chunk three mutations, sequence variants. Here in red is chunk three, so everyone has a loss of chunk three. So what do we do is, for example, I want to see what's the relationship between the gene, si the deletion size and abnormal language. So I look who has an abnormal language, and I see that, so this is marked by a, a yellow star, and, and I see that everyone, almost everyone, everyone in this case, maybe almost, has abnormal language, okay? So I can conclude that since the only thing in common among all these patients is the loss of chunk three, I can conclude that chunk three is responsible for this phenotype. If I look at another phenotype, let's say I look at heart defects, and I see that only these patients have heart defects, I can conclude that only patients with large deletions have heart defects, okay? And it means that the gene that is involved in this manifestation must be somewhere around here, but it cannot be chunk three, because you see that none of the smallest one has heart defects. And the same with renal defects. If I look who has renal defects, you see the, the, these stars, is these patients here. So maybe there is a region here that contains a gene or several genes, it doesn't have to be only one, that it's involved in renal defects. But the fact that none of the patients with small deletions or point mutations has renal defects or cardiac defects suggests that <coughs> chunk three is not involved. Remember, this is not real data. I'm going to show you the real data afterwards. Okay, this is just to show you how we interpret the, the findings, okay? So the aim is to identify genes and regions involving specific phenotypes and inform clinical practice. Okay, so if we look at intellectual disability, and we, I colored red, those that answer yes, they have intellectual disability. You see that almost everyone can have intellectual disability, the big ones and 
even tiny, tiny ones. Okay? This means that chunk 3 is responsible for this phenotype. The same happens with absence of functional language. It can happen in those with large and very, very small. So these are chunk 3 phenotypes. Okay? Same for autism. There are many patients with autism, larger and small. You see the blue up down to here, chunk 3. Same hypotonia, look, almost everyone is red, small, large, chunk 3. Are you following? Okay. <laughs> okay, look at seizures. So there are many patients with seizures. We said that there were 30% of patients with seizures. And when I look the relationship between the phenotype seizures and the genotype deletion size, I see that there are many with large deletions that have seizures. But there are many, many, and I don't know if you can see, but there are many blue here, many. So it means that chunk 3 by itself is able to cause seizures, okay? This does not exclude the possibility that there could be, for example, another gene here that also contributes to seizures and it's um, uh, adding to the risk of seizures. But chunk 3 by itself causes a very high risk for seizures. When I look at congenital heart defects, so these are malformations, you see that there are quite a bit. Remember that this was, I think it was like 10%, 13% that had this in the registry. And when I look at this correlation, I see that there are mostly are large deletions, okay? And when I look at the small deletions, there is like a sum of these small deletions here, I do see that there are two that have small deletions that have heart defects. One said that he or she has a hole in the heart, so this is like a, a lay term, so it could be a ventricular septal defect or an auricular septal defect, we don't know what th this person meant, but this is one of the options in the registry, so they chose it, and this has a ventricular septal defect. What you need to know about congenital heart defects is that there are many, many causes for these defects. There are many, many genes that are involved. So for example, there are persons that are completely normal otherwise, that are, have no intellectual disability and they can be born with a heart defect because they have a specific mutation or a genetic abnormality in another gene. So we saw two with small deletions that have these abnormalities, but this does not mean that it's chunk three that causes it. Maybe they have a second hit in another gene. We don't know. So, but I cannot conclude that this only happens in large. Before, when I did the analysis before, it seemed that no one with small deletion had it. So I thought that, okay, this is only for large deletions. Now that I see this too, I say we need more data to understand the contribution of chunk three to this phenotype, okay? You see that there are some things that are not clear cut. All the ones that I showed before are clear cut. This one is not clear cut, so we cannot conclude. Also, everything that I'm showing you have to realize that it's preliminary data, okay? These are not the final analysis of the registry. This is something that I did in, like in the past week to be able to present to you, okay? Okay, renal malformations. I think this looks really great. Very, very common. Remember that it's like 40% of the patients in the registry almost all in the patients with very large deletions. As deletion size diminishes, the risk for renal malformation appears to diminish because look that here is much less common than here, okay? And when you look at the small mutations or deletion, there is no one with renal malformation. There is one here, but this has several genes. And also, as I said, there are many different causes of renal malformations. So we would have to see what is this type and see it could be another gene, we don't know. But clearly, clearly, this suggests that in the larger deletions, there are one or several genes that affect this phenotype, okay? And look at this, how interesting it is. Lymphedema, this is the first time I analyzed this because I thought that I had never seen patients with small deletions or point mutations that had lymphedema. And I said, I'm going to analyze it to see if my theory that this is only seen in large deletions is true. So I did it, and of course, there are not many patients with lymphedema because remember that it's only 6% in the whole registry data, but remember that I only have genetic data for the analysis, array data, I only have for 300 patients. So I am losing a lot of clinical data because I don't have the genetic data, okay? You understand that. So we don't have a lot of patients, but clearly we see that all those that answered yes to lymphedema have very large deletions. And no one with a lesion smaller than 4.4 megabases has lymphedema. 
I was very happy and I said, look, this is a useful, this is preliminary. So this is not, I'm not saying that 4.4 is the definite limit for lymphedema, okay? But it's a suggestion. I was very happy and I thought that I was going to be able to give you some useful information because this means that for those that have bigger deletions, unfortunately, you have to be aware that you have the risk, but for those that have smaller deletions, which are many, they, you could say, I can feel, uh, okay, I, at least I don't have risk for lymphedema. But, 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 but. I was doing genetic consultations, and a, a mom came with a girl that has a tiny deletion involving only chunk three, so I explained everything, only chunk three, the size and everything. And when she was going away, I look at the legs of the girl, and I said, wait a moment, does she have lymphedema? Oh yes, she has lymphedema diagnosed, treated, bilateral. So my theory to the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so you see why? Because we lack data, we could make, and I'm I was not going to make the definite conclusion, but it strongly suggested something. But when we get more data, maybe we have to update everything. So the, that single patient doesn't change everything. It could, I say again, there are many causes for lymphedema. It could be that she has a different cause for lymphedema. It would be so. It could be. We have to wait. Anyway, this girl is like around here, like the smallest ones, and she has lymphedema. So we need more data to be able to conclude if patients with smaller they seem to be clearly at less risk than those with larger deletions. That's for sure. But zero risk, maybe no. Okay. So here I looked at brain MRI or CT scan abnormal findings because when we did the study of patients with chunk three point mutations, and I'm going to, I see many of you taking photos. Please know that after the conference, we're going to put these slides in the website of the foundation so you can have it and you can have the frequency of the disorders and everything and you can look at them with them. And please remember that everything is preliminary, okay? But it's, it reflects what we know today. It can change later when we get more data. So when we did the, um, the analysis of patients with point mutations in chunk three, that there were 17 patients, mostly from the Seaver Autism Center and three from Baylor. And we did a detailed clinical characterization of these patients. And I also reviewed 60 patients that have been reported in the literature. And it seemed quite clear that chunk three by itself was able to cause arachnoid cysts and decrease myelination. But because we had so few data, it was not a clear conclusion, okay? So I did this to see if my impression was uh, true. And look, when you see the green, it means that they answer yes to arachnoid cyst. So you see that larger ones have, and you go down, and many with small deletions, you see, I, I put the arrows because if not, it was not visible. There are quite a number that have arachnoid cyst. So it seems that chunk three may be involved in this uh, manifestation. And the same happens for decreased myelination. So decreased white matter, it seems that there are several here with small deletions. So this is also could be due to chunk three. Again, there might be other genes in other parts that could contribute to these phenotypes, but at least chunk three is able to cause them. Whereas at when we look at two types of other abnormalities, abnormal corpus callosum, we see Quite a number here. Remember that there were 30 overall in the registry. Uh, there is one patient with a small deletion that has one. Still, there are multiple causes for abnormal corpus callosum. We cannot conclude, okay? Cortical dysplasia, which is an abnormal migration of neurons in the cortex that can cause problems, sometimes can be associated to seizures. And uh, um, there are very few. This is a rare thing. There is only one patient here with a large uh, deletion that has one. We cannot make any conclusion there. There are too few patients, okay? Okay, so now I'm going to switch 
This that I was uh, showing was the analysis of the clinical questionnaire. Okay, remember I said there is the clinical questionnaire, the developmental questionnaire, and the adult questionnaire. So all that I analyzed up to here were the clinical questionnaire. And now I'm going to look at the data of the adult questionnaire. This is a much smaller sample because only page families that have adolescent or adult children are supposed to answer these questions. So 172 families answered the questionnaire. There is a bit more females than males. So in the frequency of the things that I'm going to show you, there it's almost always more females, but we have to keep in mind that to begin with, there were much more females than males, okay? And it's difficult to understand why is this? Why I is it moms of females more motivated to answer the questionnaire? Or is it mom of females that females are more affected so the moms are more motivated to answer the questionnaire? I don't know. Because I say, as I said, remember, this is in the chromosome 22. In principle, there shouldn't be sex differences. In principle, if there are, it would be like something unusual. It would be interesting to understand why, okay? So of these, 172, you see, it was not too much. But of these, very unfortunately, only 77 had submitted genetic reports. So this is very frustrating because it means that I could have used all this data to give it back to you, but I cannot because only 77 had genetic reports, okay? So only these are included in the genotype, phenotype analysis. Remember when I say, gen ah, sorry, when I say genetic reports, I mean genetic reports with array coordinates or specific pathogenic chunk mutation, okay? So look here, everything I'm going to present is changes in adolescence or adulthood, because this is the definition of what the questions that are asked in the adult questionnaire, okay? And this, was, this one concerns worsened condition. So did the patient exhibit worsened cognition during adolescence or adulthood? And those that answer yes are colored. So you see here, very strikingly, that some with big deletions answer yes, but most of those that answer yes are the ones that have either chunk free mutations or tiny, tiny deletions, okay? This is very surprising because if everyone lost chunk three, why would those with small deletions have increased risk for something? And what we think is that it is because these patients with chunk three mutations or small deletions have in general, it's not a rule, but in general, they have better cognitive functioning than those with very large deletions. So they, there are some that have very, very severe cognitive impairment. So I'm not saying that everyone is higher functioning, but what I'm saying is that among patients with small deletions and mutation is where we find the highest functioning kids with PMS, okay? Not everyone is high, higher functioning, but they are here. So when you have more to lose, when you lose it, it shows more. So for example, if, you're, if you never had language to begin with, you cannot notice the loss of language. But these kids, not all talk, there are many that are completely nonverbal, but among these kids, there are many that have words, several that have sentences. So if they lose the language, you're going to see it. And then it going, it's going to seem that they have this disorder that seems more frequent than here, but maybe it's because they lost something that the others never had. It could be this, we don't know, okay? So this is for cognition, and look that this pattern is going to be replicated in several other parameters. So this is increased swallowing difficulties, and here I made a composite score where I marked yes, th those that had answered that during adolescence or adulthood, they ha had increased difficulties in swallowing, increased difficulties, no, increased episodes of choking or aspiration. So anyone that answered yes to these three things, I marked with this color. And you see that some with big have this problem that appeared during adolescence or adulthood, but among these small ones is even more uh, common. And this cannot be explained by the hypothesis I just said before. Because for example, cognition, we can say, okay, those with smaller deletions had better cognition, and this is why we can see a decrease in cognition. Those with smaller deletions had better language, and this is why we can see the decrease of language. Whereas everyone swallows. I mean, the big deletions, middle deletions, everyone swallows. This is, shouldn't be related 
to the size of the lesion, and it seems, this is preliminary data, you see that we don't have a lot of patients, but it does seem, you would agree with me, even if, even if you cannot only, you, you cannot see very well here, but believe me, there are many blue here, many. So it seems that this is more common here than here. Okay, in the stoning conditions, sorry, in, in increased swallowing. Okay, you can see all the red that are here. Okay? Frequent insomnia. So episodes of insomnia, so lack of sleep appearing in adolescence or adulthood, you see that it's frequent across the board. Also quite frequent in those with tiny deletions or mutations. So the same pattern as cognition, as language. Look, loss of motor skills. Like almost everyone loses motor skills in adolescence or adulthood. In the, for this measure, I also used a composite measure where I marked as yes, those that said that they had had worsened ability to walk, worsened balance, or worsened hand use. And you can see this is not a very nice finding, I mean, to see it like that, to see how prevalent it is this uh, a loss of motor skills. What we have to keep in mind is that this data in the registry could be biased because you could imagine that a family that has a child and a, in adolescence or adulthood that exhibited a regression, okay, and showed a loss of skills is much more motivated about other questionnaires and finding what are the causes and the potential treatments. And so maybe they will feel more motivated to come and fill the questionnaire. Whereas another family that has a child that has shown no regression, has not even heard about regression, is not going to come and fill the, the questionnaire. So maybe there is a bias and the ones that have problems are coming and filling in this in. We don't know. We need more data to be able to tell that. Or, or, for example, if everyone that is adult and adolescent fills the questionnaire, then we say, okay, we're excluding a bias, and what we're seeing is real. But if we don't have the data of everyone, we cannot tell, okay? Look, this one, loss of speech and communication. It can be either complete loss or worsened ability occurring in adolescence and adulthood. So some of the largest deletions, these kids usually don't speak. They have a few words. It's very unusual that they have sentences. So you see here, it's like very rare. But here, almost all have loss of speech. Loss, or I say, complete or worse inability for communication. And remember, also, this is adulthood, adolescence. So it's not that we can take information from this very limited data to say it happens at a specific age. We don't know at which age it happens. We need much more data to answer that question. Loss of toilet training for those that were trained and lost the ability, either developing permanent urinary or fecal incontinence. You see that here you don't see anything, probably because these, ch these children never acquire toilet training. But among here with the smallers, the smallest deletions, it seems to be more common. Psychiatric diagnosis. I include here depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, or catatonia. Schizophrenia shouldn't be schizophrenia, but psychosis. And there were only two patients diagnosed with schizophrenia, and both of them also had catatonia. Okay, so this diagnosis alone does not add any separate yes. So you see, here is also very striking. Yes is much more common in this group than in the largest ones. I hope that you're interested in what I'm showing. I am very interested, I, but I keep showing and showing slides, so I hope that you also find it interesting as I do, because if not, it can be very boring, okay? <laughs> okay. So look here, increasing seizures in adolescence or adulthood, very, very common across the board. Large deletions, small deletions, very, very common, okay? We have no idea why this happens. Nothing that I'm showing, we have, we have the reason. We would like so much to know, but we don't know. But clearly, there is something, and what can I tell you, is that this is not typical of other neurodevelopmental disorders. There are many developmental disorders that kids are usually, kids, adults and adolescents are usually stable, and some even get a little bit better, but not this loss of like everything we look at. Okay. So this was the analysis I did with the, with the genetic data when I was asked to do this presentation. Um, 
but now I'm going to switch and I'm going to present the data that was the data from the registry that was analyzed by the pecorigram. Is, Ma, is Megan here? Uh, Megan, can you come and explain? So Megan is going to come and explain what is the PCORI grant and what they did, and after she explains, I'm going to present some of their findings. It's the same, the same patients, but because they can only use patients that have for, uh, signed the new consent form, okay? So this limits the number of patients that, that they can study. If everyone had signed the new consent form, they would be able to use everyone. But because some signed the old consent form and not the new one, their population is more limited than the one I used. And because I used all the data of the registry, my population was a little bit larger, okay? But Megan is going to explain who is involved and what they did. Okay, so in 2013, um, the foundation applied and received um, a PCORI award, um, like a grant. And PCORI stands for Patient-Centered Outcome uh, Initiative. And it was um, essentially the US government's way of funding uh, research that is patient-centric. In other words, um, not just things that were dreamed up by researchers or of interest to researchers. And um, it, was a, it was kind of a huge coup that we got this, this funding. Um, and some of it was used, if you all remember, CareSync to um, help you get your medical records. Um, we used it to try and recruit more people into the registry. Um, and a lot of it was used to build an infrastructure, an additional database um, up at Harvard Medical School um, <coughs> Informatics Department. So <coughs> this was done in 2014. So if you were at the 2014 conference or you've been in the registry after 2014, you have agreed or not agreed to be in this PMS DN, it's a data network. If you register before 2014 and have never gone back into the registry, you are not gonna be in this. So, so you can come by the registry help desk and I can let you know if, if you've reconsented. Um, and so it's very involved, but what the, um, the investigators up at Harvard did was um, they, they have an infrastructure that does a lot of data analysis um, in real time, and so everybody that consented, their data from the registry was sent up to Harvard, um, and it got all mapped out, and the, those 100 families that had their medical records from CareSync also went up to Harvard, and they used natural language processing to scan it and pull out more information. So our registry has more patients, but the data that went up to Harvard has more information because some of it has medical records. Um, please, if you have any question about this, see me over at the registry help desk, email me or, or, or whatever. Um, I think that, Geraldine, am I leaving anything out? Okay. So, so the, the data I'm going to present was uh, performed by Paul Avilach from Harvard University and his team and uh, he couldn't attend the conference, so I offered to present his data because I thought that it was a pity that all this effort that has been done and not shown to the families. As I said, because I was not sure that I was going to get his data, I performed the analysis I performed, so you're going to see like several things that are, most things that are repeated, analyzed in their way, it's a similar way, but what they do is that they perform statistical analysis to say if it's significant, not significant. Um, and another thing maybe is that when I analyze the registry, I look individually at every patient, and that's why I see all the mistakes. But also when I see mistakes that are obvious, I can correct them, so I, I like clean the data myself, okay? When I can clean it, okay? Whereas they don't do this, they, they use what's in the registry because they use like automatic analysis, so if there is, for example, uh, do you have congenital heart abnormalities? No. But I moved to another column and I found that yes, there is a congenital heart abnormality. So I take that information and I put yes here. I do that all the time because they put it in different co uh, columns and uh, they don't do that because it's just uh, automatically answering yes, no. Okay, so it's a bit different. Anyway, so these are the people from Paul's lab that uh, participated. Okay, so renal abnormalities instead of like taking the parameter that I, like I did and putting it together, they use each question separately. And so these are the patients that they analyzed, 239 instead of 306 that I did. A few have mutations and other have deletions. And when 
yes answer is a black, then unsure is gray, and then no, it's a light gray, okay? Like in every place, it's going to be like this, okay? Yes, it's going to be um, uh, black. So um, these are different renal malformations, and in general, I'm not going to go in detail through each one, but you see that almost all of the malformations are here in the upper part, so it confirms what I had shown you before, larger deletions have a risk for renal abnormalities that is not observed in the small ones. This one, you see that there are a few with small ones, is recurrent to urinary tract infections. And I, and I told you that this specific parameter is not a proof that you have a renal malformation. You can have other causes of urinary tract infection. So let's say that this is the, it's not specific of renal abnormalities, so in fact it shows something that is not in all the others, okay? So conclusion again, confirmed and significant. Certain renal abnormalities are only observed in those with large deletions. Cardiovascular, the same. Look, heart murmur that I didn't analyze myself seems to be more common among those that, are, that have large deletions. There are a few with small. It is significant, although not very, very significant. And congenital heart defects, mostly large, but you see that there is one here with a small. So with this one, we cannot conclude. Seizures. Everyone has seizures, but look what they show. My conclusion was everyone has seizures, chunk three is involved. But when you look at this data, I mean, clearly we have all have to accept that seizures seem to be more frequent in those that have large deletions. Don't you, it's visible there that there are more here than in this part. So this would mean that yes, chunk three is enough to cause seizures, but that there are other genes here in the larger deletions that are also contributing to increased risk of seizures, okay? This is signi highly significant and uh, it seems that there might be other genes, okay? Gastrointestinal disorders we see that these are aspirations, so difficulties uh, with swallowing and aspiration. Look, a, a few small ones, but mostly the risk is in the larger ones. Clearly, enrichment in larger deletions. This is highly significant. Okay. Uh, chronic constipation is also significant because it appears to be more common in those with larger deletions. But look, also, it's also common in the small ones. Okay, and for example, something as gastroesophageal reflux, you see all over, so not related to size. Lymphedema, okay, the, qu the questionnaire has, um, it, the left arm is swollen, the right arm is swollen, the, the left leg, the whatever, and people answer yes or no, and these were like to see if they had lymphedema, but what I realized is that some people were answering that, for example, the legs were swollen and it was not lymphedema, because then they made a comment and they said, yes, it's because she hurt her knee and whatever, and it was not lymphedema. So the question about swollen or not swollen was not good. I think the one that is good is, was your child diagnosed with lymphedema? That's the one I use, and I think that's the most useful one. So this is why I selected it here. And look that it confirms what I show you. It's diagnosed lymphedema, it's only present in the large ones, but he doesn't know that there is a tiny one that has lymphedema here, okay? We have to wait to see what happens with that. Look, this one, very interesting. I mean, nobody's going to do anything with this information, but look, those that have tall stature, so taller than expected for age, clearly enriched in those that have larger deletions, okay? Hands and feet. So for example, large fleshy hands, that is something that we've heard for a long time that is associated with Fellan McDermott, look clearly the risk is increased in those that have larger deletions, okay? Recurring in grown nails, also in larger, Whereas these plastic or unusual toenails look in everyone. Sacral dimple. Sacral dimple is a, a dysmorphic feature. It's a small hole here in the back. It doesn't have any consequence. It's just something went awry during ge the genetic, uh, uh, I mean, with the genetic information, and it's a small malformation with no importance. but. According to this data, sacral dimple is much more common in those with larger deletions. 
abnormal brain imaging findings. I remember I showed you this data before. So abnormal MRI, there are many, many that have abnormal MRI, but it seems according to this analysis that more with larger deletions seems to answer, seem to answer yes to this. Okay, and uh, for TT greening, this is not important. Irregular ventricle, I analyzed this already, okay. During the, this is some analysis of the developmental questionnaire that I didn't look for. For example, hypotonia, look, everyone has hypotonia, but more on the larger ones. Highly, highly significant, okay. So CHAN3 is able to cause hypotonia, but it, there must be other genes here also contributing. Feeding problems, also more common in those among large deletions. Development during the first year of life. What does it say? I cannot even read. Ah, had swallowing problems. Okay. Highly significant among larger deletions, uh, there are more yes answers. Okay. Required special feeds, larger deletions. Had poor sock, larger deletions. Had difficulty. Latching on breast, larger deletions. Gross motor development. Here, uh, um, in contrast to all the others I showed, here, later, it's darker. So yes, worse darker. You see here, this is highly significant, walks unassisted. So the smaller the deletion, the earlier the kids were uh, walked, the larger the deletion, the later they walked. And this is highly, highly significant. This is one of the most significant findings of all the analysis is this, walked and assisted. Look, see it with when placed, larger deletions took more time to learn to see it. Okay, also highly significant. Motor development, highly significant. Difficulty with motor planning and learning. Larger deletions have much more difficulty. Whereas floppy baby, you see all over, but much more common here in the larger ones. Okay. <coughs> Cognitive development. <coughs> this is not so significant, but there are several significant findings. With These are positive things because understanding of the use of familiar objects, and you see that the yes answers are mostly here. So this is positive, understand the use, and it's among the smallest ones. Initiate household activities during play, more here. Has functional, uses functional toys appropriately, more here. So yes, almost, yes. Okay, cognitive development, the same thing, worse in the larger ones. I had the last one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was the last <laughs> one that I have already shown. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. So are there any questions? <coughs> yes, Geraldine. Ah. Okay. Could be, could be, I'm not sure. because You know why, Megan? Because we see so many other parameters that are also neurological, that are degrading during adolescence and adulthood, that I would tend to think that the seizure increase is part of this, and it's not some artifact because we didn't recognize absent seizures in babies, and we recognize them later. Although I agree that some part of what you say can play a role, but maybe does not explain everything.
Oh, I thought it, no, but I hear the, the prevalence was 30% of seizures. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Okay, so the question is, is there a statistical difference uh, on level of functioning according to gender? The answer is, uh, we don't know. Uh, I have never made those type of analysis. As I'm saying, when I analyze this data, the feeling I have is I need more data, I need more data, I'm not able to conclude. So I wouldn't tend to go and divide the group in two to even find myself with smaller groups and more flimsy answers. You understand? It would be a great answer. I would be very interested, but I feel that we need more data to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I have to, yeah, okay. Maybe. Uh, do you have any theory as to why with other neurodevelopmental disorders there is more as they get to adults, there's more of a gain, whereas it appears in this one that there is a loss as they get older? So I, I'm not sure that we can talk of gain in the older disorders. It's either stable or they can improve a little bit on some aspects. I wouldn't call it gain. I would say more that what we see here is a loss on so many parameters, uh, and we have no idea whatsoever. This is something that's new for us that we learned in the past few years. We were not aware of this characteristic of Alan McDermott syndrome, and we're gathering the data, and we have absolutely no answers whatsoever right now about the cause, and we are, of course, very, very interesting, and we feel that this is a very important field of research. Okay, what <coughs> one comment and one question. So on the initial data uh, where you're talking about the parents asking a yes-no question, answering a yes-no question, was there a change? When you have this heterogeneous, very different group of both starting points and deletion sizes, like I don't know how much you can make any conclusions from that if you don't have a baseline, uh, you know, like like starting point. So, so, so in the in the initial slides, yeah. when it was talking about, um, uh, did your child have a change in in adolescence um, to have uh, a decrease in cognitive ability and things like that? I don't know if you can trust it at all because you don't have baseline data. Um, you know, comparing one to another. I think we, sorry? Of course. We also developed the adult, the yes. adolescent and adult questionnaire, but what we did is, you know, because we couldn't collect like baseline data, you know, you know, using objective instruments, we just asked, has there been a change and basically has it gotten better or has it gotten worse? So it's really relative to each patient. You want to add to that? Yeah, so we were assuming these people had, followed, had um, completed the basic questionnaire, we hoped most of them had, and they were asking, I think we did what, from 12, 12 and up, so they actually weren't really late teenagers, they were from 12 and up, and had they changed since the early baseline measure, I think it just went, we didn't have a baseline measure, but we were asking test, the test, parent. Test. We had it from the first questionnaire from our initial registry question. Right, and it's well, possible to do analysis on that, right? Because we've got, we have questions like, does your child speak, is your child verbal, does your child walk? Those are in the developmental yes. questionnaire, but that will be a huge project to do exactly. that analysis. No, but what I have to say is, of course, all this data is not the perfect way there must be mistakes and precisions, whatever you want. But what I can I tell you is that talking with families, they are very able to describe a uh, regression. And what they say, my child used to do this, this, and this, and this, and now he can't. I mean, nobody could doubt that there is indeed a regression. I, 
of course, as, as I said, ec ah, okay, but as I said, of course, all the results that I presented are influenced by the fact that maybe the baseline is very different among the lesions that among small, uh, uh, small deletions and sequence variants. The answer to that is when you're doing the survey, the first question is, has there been a change in ad adolescence or later? So if you answer no, it does not give you the possibility of answering later. So it does have a baseline component to it. Hi. Um, I actually just started taking the second survey yesterday. Uh, thank you for letting us know, by the way. You know, if you have, like I went to check the registry and realized that we hadn't uploaded our genetic data, so we've done so now. And I've take, uh, started going through the, um, uh, the survey, and just a comment in terms of uh, some of the questions I wasn't sure how to answer in terms of the questions were posed, um, for example, tricycle, you know, has, did your child, uh, was your child able to ride a tricycle, or, or is your child able to ride a tricycle? And I'm not sure if I'm supposed to answer as to now, or as to she was, but now she can no longer, um, things like that, and are we supposed to uh, come back and do the survey every couple of years, and then you guys have that data because I didn't do it before her regression. So there, there are several questions like that which I'm not really sure how to answer, and gives you messy data as well. I know. Unfortunately, the the questions are not perfect. Okay, w uh, they started that we had to start somewhere. We started like that. When I analyze the data, I also see many many problems. What you're pointing is a perfect way. A example of something that is unclear. So of course you ask unclear questions, you get unclear data, <laughs> and so when we realize that, what I do is I don't analyze it. Okay, but uh, what you what you said is uh, people are given the possibility of coming again and updating their uh, answers, and all the versions are there. The thing is that it's a huge work to, I mean. I haven't slept for many <laughs> days, and I will give you details. <laughs> she hasn't. Just analyzing this, imagine if I had male, female. Some have eight uh, uh, different answers over time. I mean, well, not yet. Maybe later when we have more data, we can factor that in. Yes. Um, yeah, since like I was the <laughs> one of the team that um, launched this in 2011, there are a lot of bad questions, and we know that. And someday, we hope to have the funding to simplify this and someday we hope to make it so that if your child is two years old that you don't have to even see the puberty questions or if you've already answered the pregnancy questions, you don't have to go back and answer them. But for now, it is what it is. Um, and I appreciate any feedback because someday I hope that we can make it even better. Um, if you choose to, we would like you to go in once a year, maybe on your child's birthday to update. But the way the platform works is you have to re-answer every single question you will not see your old answers, but we still have them. Some researchers do request data over the years, so they will see every answer you ever got, and some researchers just want to see the most recent data for that, for that child. The same thing goes if you have multiple genetic reports. Some people had an old genetic report, and then they're in a study and they have a better genetic report. All of those genetic reports need to be in there, mom, dad, whatever you have. And the researchers can look at it. And for the genetic reports, please be assured that we looked at them. We really need every genetic report you have. Because some say, oh, I forgot to upload the most recent one that showed the most important thing. Please send that to us that we look at every genetic report. Well, that would be a lot for me to ask for you to do, but, but if you've I got nothing know. but time no. on your hands. No. <laughs> well, you know, there are some questions that are past tense, answer those past, you know, from the past. Right. There are some that are present tense, answer those for current. I want to introduce Brittany McLarney. She is, she is our registry coordinator, yay. She's, she's actually the one receiving the genetic reports and, you know, trying to make sense of what's in there and getting that data um, organized. And then she sends it off in a de-identified fashion to Dr. Betancourt, who works with her on just ensuring everything's correct. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Brittany. Not much to say right now, but I, I think ideally do the best you can with what's in there. And my email's fairly easy to remember. It's my name, Brittany, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y at PMSF.org. Send me your feedback. Because it's one thing for me to put a lot of thought into what the questions should look like, but when you're using them, how's it 
how you interpreting them is a big, big important part of what we're doing. So blow up my inbox, send me millions of emails and let me know what you think and what could be better and how you would word it different and what you think. So that would be very helpful. It might not change right away, but if as I gather the data, we can move forward with it. I, I just want to incentivize you a little bit more. Um, hypothetically, let's say I answered no to seizures a few years ago and then my child started having seizures and hypothetically, let's say I didn't update the answers. Um, and recently there was a recruitment letter that went out to families about a seizure study. So that letter only went out to families in the fa registry that had said yes to seizures. And hypothetically, I called the registry coordinator and I said, I didn't get that letter, why? And she checked my answers, hypothetically, and I had not updated my information. <laughs> so if you don't want to update it every year, by all means, if you get a new diagnosis, you should want to update it because that's how, you know, some, some researchers are looking by zip code, some people, researchers are looking by a genetic size, and some are looking by um, symptom. So again, um, just to incentivize you a little bit. I'm going to say something related to this, just short thing. Uh, I really would not encourage you to do it every year if there has been no change, because really, the data now, it, the numbers are so limited that we cannot factor in this time thing for every, however, if there is a new medical diagnosis, a new genetic diagnosis, something that happened, please do inform us, my child developed seizures, my, de my child developed se lymphedema, my child was diagnosed with a lesion and now he had a karyotype and he had a ring chromosome. We want to know those things, but just to go to tell us that now she is toilet trained and before she was and just for that, no, okay? Let me say from the genetic standpoint, I find parents highly aware of what's going on with their child. You guys are able to tell what your child's developmental quotient or IQ is, and the way I do it is I ask a family, okay, your child's eight years old. Compared to other children, where do you think your child is functioning? And I can tell you when the parent says they're at four, they act like a four-year-old, that equates to a developmental quotient or an IQ of 50. No slam on the developmental pediatricians or developmental psychologists, but those parents are pretty damn on the money when it comes to after all that testing is done, oh yeah, that's what they said the IQ was. It was 50 to 55. So. Uh, I think parents are awesome at knowing where their kids are. You guys are acutely aware of that. So I think that data is good because parents are good at focusing on their children. Never argue with a mama is what I say. So I... I see the analysis done by you and, and the other group was all focused on the 22Q13 region, <laughs> but we all have genetic reports that include other regions where there are other abnormalities, and are, are we, or when are we, um, going to get researchers that will be looking at genotype, phenotype correlations that include some of those other aspects of our genome? Well, first of all, when we do this type of analysis and, and we conclude, for example, that renal abnormalities are only present in those with larger deletions, this already uh, situates the region of interest in the farther ones, okay, more Central American ones. So there is interest there. We need more data, and our goal would be to identify the gene or the genes that are involved in renal abnormalities or cardiac abnormalities or lymphedema or, or whatever. The thing is that the population that we have with terminal deletions, this, this drawing that I do with larger extending to smallest that go up to the end, is something that does not exist uh, elsewhere in chromosome 22. Don't think that this exists elsewhere and we're not analyzing. It's that deletions that are not terminal in chromosome 22 are not as common. In fact, these, I, I don't know if you were, yeah, you were in the other talk when I talked about interstitial deletions that are farther away from the, from the end, and they are very rare. There are only a handful of patients that have been described. So families come to us and say, can you please analyze this? And, uh, and we don't have the data. Okay, 
because to analyze this, we would need those that don't have the terminal point to be able to determine the contribution of these genes that is not related to chunk three or other of the terminal genes. It's very complicated. gene and you hope that those are relatable to a human but there's only so many things you can ask a mouse to do or a zebrafish to do and uh, that may not accurately represent what the effect of that gene is in a human so but again it's very expensive those are years of research that people will spend on a single gene. We know shank three is a hot gene. It's, it can cause many of the things we see. In fact, most of the things we see, that's why the money has been spent there. You can also get funding to study shank three, whereas you may not be able to get funding to study another gene because that gene has not been well delineated, defined, and does not have uh, the data, natural history data, that you have for shank three. I'm not saying don't study those genes. By all means, we need to look at those. However, we have less data, and we don't have those mouse models and zebrafish models readily available. I'm going to kind of make a pitch for another research study. It's called All of Us, and it's a, a project here in the United States where they're, we're trying to enroll a million Americans, not necessarily with rare disease, but with healthy people, people with disease, diabetes, obesity, any kind of condition or no condition at all, and they're going to be doing sequencing. What they're doing is they're, they're really trying to aggregate a huge amount of genetic data on all Americans, and through large projects like that, we're going to learn more about other genes in the, in the genome, in the 22Q13 region for sure, but all across the genome. And once that comes out, we'll have, you know, probably better understanding of susceptibility genes, right? And, and the next step, as Curtis was mentioning, is then to do like functional studies to develop animal models and other kinds of um, research projects to really understand how those mutations or variants contribute to human disease. But those are really huge projects that have you, to occur. You've <laughs> got to realize that most of the characteristics that occur in Phelan McDermott syndrome, intellectual disability, seizures, uh, gastroesophageal reflux are not in, they occur in the population without Phelan McDermott syndrome, and many times they are a result of multiple environmental and genetic factors, and quantitating multiple contributions from multiple genes is incredibly difficult to tease out, and we're just not good at that right now. What causes high blood pressure? Well, gee, there is no high blood pressure gene, and I'll get hit nearer to home. What causes autism? Well, if it was one gene and we had the Holy Grail, there wouldn't be 100 genes on the autism panels. So if you find a gene for autism that causes 1% of the autism in, the, in your autism population, you hit a hot gene. But what about the other 99%? and realize that for intellectual disability in genetics, we are roughly at a 500 batting average. So 50% of the time, we are left without being able to give the family any idea about what caused their child's intellectual disability. We have a higher batting average if it is severe intellectual disability than we do if it is mild, because when it gets mild, we start talking about things like cultural familial intellectual disability, which just means we don't know what in the heck we're talking about. There's other family members who have mild developmental issues, but we can't put our finger on a gene. In fact, we can't put our finger on any gene, so therefore we say, well, it's environmental 
and multiple genetic factors combined. We, we have time for maybe one last question over here. Yes, I had a question regarding um, the ability to correlate uh, the regression that you're seeing with age, with um, the reduction in services that children receive as they get older and they eventually graduate out of uh, services or they get tapered off into adults. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, hearing what you said. Can you repeat? I was asking if we have sufficient data to be able to correlate the reduction in services that children receive as they get older oh with God. regression. It would be nice. Yeah, no, I agree. It would be nice, and, and we need more research studies that really look at kind of, uh, you know, kind of those envir so-called environmental factors and how they influence outcomes. And as of yet, I'm not sure. Any researchers here that are working on that? I mean, not even the developmental center on top of these consortium. I'm not sure that they're really asking the level of data that we need to answer that question, that that is a great research yeah. project. Can we have one? We have to get him. Okay. Yeah. They're not getting a lot of stimulation like they were getting mm -hmm. when they were in school, ABA therapy, and things like that. So I think that is a fantastic question. Um, we have to wrap it up now. We are, we're going to be kicked out of this room. Um, but I, I just want to maybe ask maybe if any of the people working in genetic, genetics don't mind coming up to the front to maybe help answer a few more questions. Catalina, I know Dr. Bettencourt will be here, and Curtis, Katie, Jamie Holder, I see you, young ways, <laughs> John Bernstein here. If y'all don't mind just hanging out for a few minutes, maybe you guys can chat, or maybe right out in the foyer, because I think they have to turn this room over for the next session. And thank you guys all so much. Thank you to, our, to Dr. Betancourt and for everybody else who participated.